Hey, what's going on fam? It's Aces High, and today I'm bringing you guys another video in the Napoleonic Wars series uh, by Epic History TV. If you guys haven't checked them out, go check out their channel. They have awesome videos, and uh, seriously, if, if I were you, I would subscribe to them because they are just constantly being, they're releasing awesome videos all the time. Um, that being said, if you haven't subscribed to me, make sure you hit that sub button because I do release at least seven videos a day. Uh, mostly history, but I'm trying to get a little bit into geography as well, because, I mean, there's something about maps, I just really dig them, you know? Anyway, uh, today's video that we're going to be watching is one of the Epic History TV videos, and you can find the link to the original video down in the description. It's towards the end, uh, Napoleon's been on the run, and uh, this one's titled uh, 1813, The Battle of the Nations. So it's, uh, it's going to be a hell of a fight. It's, uh, it's getting real close, that's for sure. Um, I don't know what's going to happen, but it's not looking good for Napoleon. All right, well, this one's going to be a long one. It's uh, after commentary and stuff. It's probably going to be close to 40 minutes. But I uh, hope you guys enjoy it and uh, sit back, relax. I'll shut up and let's get started. October 1813. Napoleon Bonaparte faced his greatest crisis since becoming Emperor of the French nine years before. His long war in Spain had ended in defeat, and an Anglo-Spanish-Portuguese army had now crossed the Pyrenees to invade France itself. In Germany, the Kingdom of Bavaria had switched sides and joined the Sixth Coalition against France. While in Saxony, Napoleon faced four armies converging on him from all directions. Hmm. What's more, these were not the same bunglers he'd crushed in 1805 and 6 at Austerlitz and Jena. Prussia, Austria and Russia had all learned from their mistakes. They were now better organised, trained and led. And yeah, they've, uh, I mean, they've been fighting Napoleon so long, they've just, they've had time to learn. If you didn't learn, you're just going to lose again. you got to learn from your mistakes. And it's been, I've seen it, it's been getting harder and harder for Napoleon to win this, uh, these battles. And uh, on, I mean, with that, Napoleon's army is getting weaker and weaker as well. And now he's basically trapped. Now it's kind of, uh, it's kind of like attacking a, a cornered cat, you know. You just, uh, you don't want to go for it. But uh, you got to more wary of Napoleon. The largest coalition force was the Army of Bohemia, commanded by Austrian Field Marshal, the Prince of Schwarzenberg. His was a huge mixed Austrian-Russian-Prussian army of 194,000 men and 790 guns. Wow. To the north, Blücher's army of Silesia and the army that's incredible. Uh, it really is just, I mean, what, 200,000 just for him? ...of the North under Napoleon's ex-marshal Bernadotte, now Crown Prince of Sweden. Together, 130,000 men and 536 guns. To the southeast, General Benningsen's Army of Poland, besieging Dresden. Another 34,000 men and 135 guns. In total, the coalition had fielded 360,000 wow. men and 1,500 guns, with Russia supplying the bulk of the troops. Here's the thing, what did Napoleon have at this time? A couple hundred thousand, maybe? Um, I mean, he might have better fortif fortifications, but he's also being attacked from three sides. It, uh, I mean, there's no way he could win this battle. One unique addition to Bernadotte's Army of the North was a single troop of British rocket artillery. Oh, that's cool. An experimental weapon system based on the Congreve rocket, a type seen here in 1830. Although wildly inaccurate, their high explosive warhead could be devastating at close range. <laughs> Napoleon's forces around Leipzig were outnumbered almost two to one. But with 200,000 men and 700 guns, the Grande Armée was still a force to be reckoned with, with many experienced troops and commanders. 
even though it increasingly relied on young conscripts to make up numbers. There were another 140,000 men that Napoleon could not call on. General Rapp's 10th Corps besieged yeah. in Danzig, Marshal Saint-Cyr's 1st Corps besieged in Dresden, Marshal Davout's 13th Corps holding Hamburg, as well as several smaller besieged garrisons across Germany and Poland. Napoleon was currently about 20 miles north of Leipzig, with the bulk of his army. Marshal Murat was 40 miles to the south, with 90,000 men, covering Schwarzenberg. Napoleon now decided to rapidly join Murat, and with their temporary superiority in numbers, defeat Schwarzenberg, before Bernadotte and Blücher could intervene. That's actually a really good move. If you can knock out one of them, suddenly now you're only facing two enemies instead of three. And uh, I don't remember how many troops he had, but I mean, that will even, that'll get the numbers closer to even, you know? Murat had orders to conduct a fighting withdrawal northwards. But at Liebert Volkwitz, he was drawn into major combat with the enemy's advance guard. Around 12,000 horsemen fought what some have described as the largest cavalry battle in Europe's history. Really? Murat, in the thick of it as usual, was very nearly captured by Prussian dragoons. The battle ended in a minor coalition victory, with around 2,000 casualties on each side. The next day, Napoleon arrived to take command. This video is sponsored. Oh, sorry about that, you guys. Oh wow, they're breaking it down per day. By the 16th of October, Napoleon had concentrated most of his forces south of Leipzig. Field Marshal Schwarzenberg, meanwhile, against Russian advice, had deployed his army on either side of the Pleiser River, which would hinder his movements throughout the battle. Napoleon had entrusted the northern sector to Marshal Ney, with orders to keep an eye out for Blücher and Bernadotte. But Napoleon didn't expect them for at least another day, and so Ney had orders to transfer most of his troops south for the attack on Schwarzenberg. Schwarzenberg, wow. however, knew that Blücher and Bernadotte were closer than Napoleon suspected and that Bennigsen was also marching up from Dresden. Oh, wow. This was the moment the coalition had been waiting for. All their armies converging on Napoleon, with overwhelming superiority in numbers. However, the coalition's headquarters were nothing like Napoleon's, where one man's will decided all. Schwarzenberg had to attempt to coordinate the actions of three large armies from three separate states. And although he was commander-in-chief, his plans still needed to be approved by Emperor Alexander, the supreme commander, whilst he also managed relations with the King of Prussia and the Emperor of Austria, all of whom were present at his headquarters. The plan finally agreed was for General Wittgenstein's corps group to lead an attack in four main columns, with two Austrian flanking attacks west of the Pleiser. At 8 a.m. a bombardment began along the line, as Russian, Austrian and Prussian infantry regiments advanced across cold, muddy fields. Wachau soon fell to Russian infantry, but French artillery fire made it impossible for them to advance further. Victor's second corps then counterattacked, retaking the village at Bayonet Point. Wachau would change hands twice more that morning. These bloody contests for small Saxon villages would come to typify the fighting around Leipzig. At Markleberg, Kleist's Prussian 2nd Corps drove out the Polish defenders after bitter fighting. 
while on the left bank of the Pleiße, Merveldt's Austrian 2nd Corps struggled across broken ground to attack well-defended villages. Their okay. assault on Konowitz stalled, but with heavy losses, the Austrians got a toehold in Dörlitz. On the right flank, around 10 a.m., Klinau's 4th Corps occupied the high ground of the Kolmberg and fought its way into Liebert Volkwitz. Napoleon, observing from Gallows Hill, ordered up Augereau's 9th Corps and the Young Guard in support. Macdonald's 11th Corps was now also arriving in position on his left. Oh, wow. His troops... I understand what Napoleon's doing. He's, uh, he's trying to push the battle down here before the people arrive in the north. But, uh, like they hinted, he doesn't realize how close the uh, two people to the north are, uh, I think, yet. And, uh, or, I mean, they might already be here. Maybe I'm just misunderstanding. But uh, if he's spreading out all of his troops, except for, you know, a few reserves back here, he's going to have trouble in the north in a second. Retook the Kolmberg and counterattacked Liebert Vogfitz, driving out the Austrians and pursuing them over the fields beyond. The advance was only halted when Russian Cossacks were sighted on their open left flank, a warning that Bennigsen's army was not far off. Hmm. The coalition offensive was going nowhere, with most of its modest gains lost to French counterattacks. But there was one sector where the coalition had more success that morning. General Gulai's Austrian Third Corps, with orders to threaten Napoleon's line of retreat, advanced over marshy ground towards Lindenau. Ney had to divert Bertrand's Fourth Corps to reinforce the village and ensure the road to France was kept open. Napoleon was waiting for Ney's reinforcements before launching his attack on Schwarzenberg. But now, 4th Corps was tied down at Lindenau, and there was more bad news from Ney. Blücher's army of Silesia was approaching from the northwest. Marmont's 6th Corps had had to turn about to keep the Prussians at bay. Heavy fighting broke out around Merkern the village itself held by elite French marines, while Dombrovsky's Polish division clung on to Vidrich under attack from an entire Russian corps. This was a nasty surprise for Napoleon, yeah. who thought Blücher was still a day's march away. I can't believe he showed up the first day, that's really got to hurt Napoleon, because now he's got I mean, to send more troops up there, and who knows when uh, the last guy's going to show up. Uh, what's his name? The uh, the king, the crown prince of Sweden, uh, Bornadot or something like that. But the old Prussian general, hearing cannon fire to the south, had urged his men on and into the attack. Blücher intended to draw as many French troops onto himself as possible to assist Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia. Hmm. His actions Smart. and the bloody fight for Merkern may just have saved the coalition from defeat. Napoleon was outnumbered across the whole battlefield. But in the south, he still had a numerical advantage. Not as large as he'd hoped, nor likely to last long. Schwarzenberg and Alexander were already moving up reserves, though Schwarzenberg now found that his were on the wrong side of the Pleiße River, costing precious hours. It was now or never for Napoleon. At 2 p.m., he ordered the attack to begin. A grand battery of 180 guns blasted the enemy lines. Then Victor's 2nd Corps, Lauriston's 5th Corps, and the Young Guard began their advance. In support, Murat gathered two entire cavalry corps, 10,000 horsemen, and led them in one of the great mass cavalry charges of the Napoleonic Wars. 
cuirassiers of the 1st Heavy Cavalry Division broke through to the main enemy battery. Some even nearly reached the three coalition monarchs. But the ground was marshy and broken by fences and ditches. The French horses were soon exhausted and the squadrons disordered. Austrian cuirassiers and Russian guard cavalry were coming up from the south. When these fresh Allied cavalry reserves charged the French, a great melee ensued. Wow. But the French were eventually driven back to their start line. Maison's division of the 5th Corps was involved in a desperate struggle for Golden Gossa. The fighting swept back and forth through the village, the streets filling with dead and wounded from both sides. But as Russian and Prussian... God damn, this is, it's just an incredible battle. This has to be one of the bloodiest, biggest battles of Napoleon's career. I mean, just, it's incredible. Guard regiments arrived to reinforce the village. The French were forced to fall back. Around 4 p.m., the Austrian Reserve Corps finally arrived and renewed the assault on Markleberg, wow. one of the morning's objectives, which was finally secured. By 5 p.m., it was clear that Napoleon didn't have enough reserves to force a decisive outcome in the south. To the north, Merkern was being stubbornly held by French marines with lethal close-range artillery support. But despite terrible losses, York's Prussian Corps continued to attack. Marshal Marmont himself was wounded twice, but remained in command. Twice, huh? Finally, a brilliant charge by Prussian Hussars triggered a French rout. Before we get into that charge, um, that's actually one of the generals I'm super excited to learn about. Um, he, uh, I've just seen him so much throughout the, the series, and I'm just really excited to learn his history. Merkern fell as Marmont's corps streamed back towards Leipzig. <laughs> as dusk fell around 6 p.m., fighting died out across the that. battlefield. The first day of the battle had cost the French an estimated 25,000 casualties. The coalition, at least 30,000. Napoleon had come close, but failed to land a decisive blow. Hmm. The chance for victory was slipping from his grasp. I agree. Let me just talk about Napoleon for a second. Think about this. The man is surrounded from all different sides. He's outnumbered. Outgunned. They have... Oftentimes they have better trained uh, soldiers than a lot of his soldiers. And yet somehow they took more losses than he did in the day. That just shows how incredible Napoleon is. That just, that blows, I mean, it blows my mind. Out of all, uh, he just, he has to be one of the best military strategists I've ever seen. Or even heard of. Leipzig. Sunday the 17th of October brought a lull, with both armies exhausted by the previous day's fighting. Napoleon needed to rest his troops and resupply them with ammunition, which was running dangerously low. He also sent a message to his father-in-law, Emperor Francis I, suggesting an armistice and finally offering concessions. But the Allies were no longer interested. They knew time was on their side. The only major combat that day occurred in the north, where Blücher continued to attack. Russian infantry stormed Eutrich and Gorlis. Russian hussars charged and routed part of Arigi's 3rd Cavalry Corps. Wow. That day, Napoleon received 14,000 reinforcements when Rainier's French Saxon 7th Corps arrived from the northeast. 
but the same day the coalition received more than a hundred thousand reinforcements, as their armies continued to converge on Leipzig. Colorado's Austrian First Corps. Bennigsen's Army of Poland. And Bernadotte's Army of the North. Wow. Though the latter was widely criticised for his leisurely march to the battlefield. The next day, Napoleon would... You know, I was going to ask that. Both these guys in the north seemed like they were about the same distance away, yet he gets here a full day before him? It kind of brings me back to that whole, well, you can go into battle if you'd like. This guy doesn't seem like that great of a marshal or a leader, but uh, I don't know. Hopefully he's on the marshal series, so I get to learn a little bit more about him. We'll see, though. ...would face odds of nearly two to one. It was time for the Emperor to begin planning his retreat. Yeah. On Monday morning, the sun shone across 40 square miles of battlefield, on which nearly half a million troops and 2,000 cannon were assembled. Soldiers from France, Germany, Russia, Austria, Poland, Italy, Sweden, the Netherlands, and even Britain. This wow. was truly the Battle of the Nations. Hey, they said the title. In preparation for his withdrawal, Napoleon pulled back his forces into a tighter defensive perimeter and ordered Bertrand's 4th Corps to march west to secure the army's line of retreat. Two divisions of the Young Guard under Marshal Mortier took their place at Lindenau. Schwarzenberg, meanwhile, planned to close the net on Napoleon with six converging attacks. Oh my god. Fighting in the south began around 8 a.m. The Austrians took Derlitz, but Marshal Oudinot led a counterattack at the head of a young guard division and drove them out again. Schwarzenberg was so alarmed by this reverse that he sent orders to recall Gulai's 3rd Corps. Oh, that's going to give the French an escape. General Barclay's troops initially faced little opposition as they took Wachau and Liebert Volkwitz, scenes of such bitter fighting two days before, but now scarcely defended. Barclay then paused, waiting for Bennigsen to get into position on his right before continuing his attack. Bennigsen's troops had more ground to cover, but towards noon, they'd driven back MacDonald's infantry and taken their objectives. They would now wait for Bernadotte's army to link up on their right. But the Army of the North was again making slow progress, for which many again blamed its commander, who seemed exceedingly cautious about facing his old master in battle. Blücher... I guess that's because the last time that he faced, or that he was in a battle with Napoleon, not necessarily against him, but would probably be when he was his marshal, right? And uh, those were the days where he, Napoleon was a very, very scary man. I mean, he, he still is, but just uh, the Napoleon and the army that he had at that time is something you wouldn't want to face. So, I mean, I, I get his hesitation. That being said, he still just doesn't seem like the best leader to me. Let me know what you guys think in the comments, though. In contrast, did not hesitate to launch Russian infantry against Leipzig's northern defences, though their attack failed with heavy losses. By 2pm, Napoleon was hard-pressed on all fronts, but holding his own. His attention was now focused on Probstheide, key to his southern front, under attack from Kleist's Prussian 2nd Corps. French troops had turned the village into a fortress and inflicted terrible losses on the advancing Prussians. Wow. Probstheide was soon engulfed in smoke and fire as fighting raged on all sides. 
Some Prussian regiments lost half their men attacking the village, while three French generals were killed as they organized its defense. You always talk about, uh, or you always hear about the soldiers and everything in these type of situations, but what about the people of that village, the people who lived there? The French show up, where I'm sure it was a war zone for a long time, so a lot of the people were already gone, but what about the rest of the people? They just burned down with the village? I mean, what happens to them? They're robbed by the French, or are they kicked out of their houses, or, or uh, they voluntarily leave? I mean, there's so many things, and then suddenly if you do stay now, you're in a battlefield, and the whole town's on fire, and... You know, it just, oh, it's got to be rough. Napoleon even sent in Friant's division of the guard to reinforce the position. To the north, Bernadotte's army was finally joining the battle in earnest. Marmont had assembled 137 guns around Schoenefeld which poured fire into the Russian ranks. Hmm. In response, Bernadotte massed 200 guns of his own. The fields were soon strewn with the dead and wounded, as the sheer weight of fire made it impossible for either side to advance. Around 3pm, wow. von Bülow's Prussian Corps, supported by Austrian Jaegers and its small British rocket detachment, attacked Poundsdorf. Grenier's 7th Corps could not withstand the onslaught. An hour later, around 3,000 Saxon soldiers rushed over to the enemy and surrendered. The Saxons were deeply disillusioned with their French allies. Their main wish now was for a quick end to a war that had ravaged their homeland for many months. Yeah. Wow. The That's hole surprising. in the line created by the Saxons' defection was soon plugged by guard cavalry. But the coalition juggernaut could not be stopped. Towards dusk, under relentless Russian pressure, Marmont abandoned the burning ruins of Schoenefeld, while the Prussians took Sellerhausen. In the south, Probst Haider still held but the situation was grim for Napoleon. The third day's fighting cost both sides another 25,000 casualties. Napoleon's army was exhausted, outnumbered, virtually encircled, and critically low on ammunition. And they're only down to, what, 145,000, 140,000 uh, soldiers left? That's, that's not very much against that giant army. They need to get the hell out of there. Finally, the Emperor gave the order to retreat. Yeah. Overnight, under cover of darkness and early morning fog, the French army withdrew behind Leipzig's walls, and at 4am began its retreat west, crossing the single bridge over the Elster River that led back to France. There'd been time and materials to build extra bridges, but in what would prove a serious oversight, no one had given the necessary orders. Furthermore, there was no clear plan for Leipzig's defence, which was left to a jumble of understrength units, mostly Poles and Germans. Wow. Napoleon left Leipzig around 10 a.m. Behind him, there were scenes of mounting chaos and confusion, the city's streets jammed with troops, guns and wagons. The 20,000 wounded troops in the city had little hope of escape. Yeah. 30 minutes later, shells began to rain on the city, as the coalition launched an all-out assault from north, east and south. The rear guard held the city's gates for as long as they could, but they were soon overwhelmed by the enemy, and savage street fighting broke out across the city. A 
barge packed with gunpowder had been moored beneath the Elster Bridge, so that it could be quickly destroyed after the rearguard crossed. Around 2pm, a corporal lit the fuse when he saw wow. Russian soldiers on the far bank. Imagine being that corporal. Uh, you know, I mean, wow. Even though the bridge was still packed with troops, wagons and oh horses. Oh my god. The bridge was destroyed in a gigantic explosion that trapped 30,000 men and 30 generals on the wrong side of the river. Panic broke out among those who suddenly found themselves cut off. Most became prisoners, but some tried to swim for it, including the Polish Prince Poniatowski, made a marshal by Napoleon just three days before. Wow. Weak from his wounds, he rode his horse into the river. But as it tried to climb the steep far bank, it rolled over him, and he was drowned. Marshal Macdonald had also been cut off by the blast, and resolved to escape or die trying. He found a place where engineers had cut down two trees as a makeshift bridge, and made his attempt. And there I was, one foot on either trunk and the abyss below me. A high wind was blowing. I was wearing a large cloak, and fearing that someone would grab at it, I got rid of it. I was already three quarters of the way across, when some men decided to follow me. Their unsteady feet caused the trunks to shake, and I fell into the water. Fortunately, I could touch the bottom, but the bank was steep, the soil loose and slippery. Some of the enemy's skirmishers came up. They fired at me point blank and missed me. Wow. And some of our men, who happened to be nearby, drove them off and helped me out. I was wet from head to foot, breathless and sweating heavily from my efforts. Marshal Marmont, who had got across early in the day, gave me a horse. I wanted dry clothes more, but they were not to be had. I mean, you'll be fine without dry clothes at that point, right? It's August. It's August in France. I mean, it's beautiful. The loss of the bridge turned what was already a heavy defeat for Napoleon into a disastrous one. Wow. Later that day, the three allied monarchs met in the centre of Leipzig to celebrate their great victory. It had come at enormous cost. Exact numbers are impossible to establish, but in four days fighting, the coalition armies suffered at least 52,000 casualties. Napoleon, wow. who could less afford such losses, came off worse. 47,000 killed and wounded, 35,000 taken prisoner, 325 guns wow. lost. More men were killed and wounded at Leipzig than in any European battle before the First World War. I believe that. Sir George Jackson, the British ambassador to Austria, rode over the battlefield with Metternich, the Austrian foreign minister, two days later. A more revolting and sickening spectacle I never beheld, he wrote. Scarcely could we move forward a step without passing over the dead body of some poor fellow, gashed with wounds and clotted with blood, another perhaps without an arm or a leg, here and there a headless trunk or a head only, which caused our horses to stumble or start aside. It made one's blood run cold to glance upon the upturned faces of the dead. We got over this field of glory as quickly as we could. Oh my god. It's not a good day for Napoleon. It's, uh, it's, Napoleon it's almost the end. Napoleon suffered a calamitous defeat. He had lost the battle for Germany. His domination of Europe appeared at an end. With 80,000 survivors, he began a fighting retreat to the French border. There was now no chance of rescue for the 100,000 men trapped in garrisons across Germany and Poland, though some would hold out for another five months. Wow. Marshal Murat took his leave of the Emperor, 
assuring him of his loyalty, but secretly planning to cut a deal with the Allies to save his throne in Naples. It was the last time the two men saw each other. Eleven days after the Battle of Leipzig, Napoleon's former allies, the Bavarians, tried to block his escape at Hanau with 40,000 men. The Bavarian commander, von Vreda, had served with Napoleon in many campaigns. But on seeing his deployment for battle, Napoleon remarked, I made him a count, but I couldn't make him a general. The French Emperor then ordered the Imperial Guard to lead an attack that forced the enemy to fall back in disarray. The French army reached the safety of Mainz three days later. Napoleon himself pushed on to Paris to contain the political damage from his defeat. Behind him, his empire was being dismantled. On the 4th of November, the coalition announced the dissolution of the Confederation of the Rhine, several of its former members now joining the war against France. In the Illyrian provinces, local revolts, Austrian invasion and British naval support brought an end to French rule. In North Italy, Eugène was retreating steadily before the advance of von Hiller's Austrian army. Wow. While in Hamburg, Marshal Davu, with 34,000 troops, would soon be cut off and under siege. Too late. Napoleon's situation was desperate. But in the next campaign, fought for France itself, Napoleon would prove that he was still the master of war. Wow. All right, you guys, let's have a talk about that. Um... Wow, Napoleon, I mean, it's just, it's the end. You're being closed in on. Uh, I'm sure that you can make one final defense, but it just, uh, there were too many, it wasn't even mistakes. You're, he, Napoleon, in my opinion, fantastic leader, fantastic strategist, uh, just military genius. Um, it was a few small mistakes. And uh, the biggest mistake, I guess, was how much time it takes to take over Europe. And this, I guess that's not even really a mistake by Napoleon. It's as, uh, as time went on and, and these people, these countries lost battles against Napoleon, they just learned how to fight him, you know? So just, uh, it's, it's interesting. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, we do have two more, two more videos. I think the next one's called The Battles of France um, or France, 1814, something like that. Uh, and then the Battle of Waterloo. So I'm really excited about that. Again, after those two, we're going to get into the Marshall series and learn about all of Napoleon's marshals um, before we move on to a different type of war. I don't know what yet, uh, but I'm really excited. If you guys have any suggestions on any other series that I should watch, let me know. After the marshals, that is. Um, anyway, hope you guys liked it. Till next time, this is Ace is High. I love y'all, and I'm out.